So hi, everybody. My name's Harvey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and a member of this group. Tonight, we are starting chapter four in our big book, We Agnostics, and a very important chapter to me personally, because I had some pretty mixed up ideas of what I believed, who I believed in, how that worked, how that didn't work. And so I had some work to do in this in this area of accepting a power greater than myself. Fortunately, this book was here. I had this book. My sponsor gave me this book and directed me to this chapter in my first couple of weeks in AA. So I read this and I read this over and over again and I learned a lot and I really started feeling better about my chances of recovery by studying this chapter. This chapter made it happen for me. So we've read in the previous chapters, including the doctor's opinion, Bill's story, there is a solution and uh, more about alcoholism, all kinds of facts about being an alcoholic. Uh, the doctor told us we had an allergy to alcohol and once we had a drink, we couldn't stop. We, so we learned that and that kind of let us off the hook for a moment because we weren't that bum who just wanted to drink rather than do his job or take care of his family. We were a sick person who had an allergy to alcohol and didn't know it. Um, so our alcoholism was untreated. Then we read Bill's story and we heard the story of a guy from his first drink to his last drink and all the stuff he went in in between those two things and then how he recovered. In more about alcoholism, we learned all different kinds of alcoholics and we had a lot of great discussions about certain types of alcoholics. We had that businessman who retired for 25 years, then picked up a drink again and ended up in a few months being in the hospital and a few years he was dead. So once an alcoholic, all, always an alcoholic. Then we read about Jim who just had a insane thought one moment and ended up getting drunk all over again. We talked about the jaywalker and how the jaywalker character resembled alcoholism quite a bit. And then we talked about Fred, who uh, had never started the program, who refused to believe that he couldn't do it himself. And he finally got taught the hard way that he needed help. And he asked for help finally, and he got sober. So <clears throat> now, so, we should have answered a lot of your questions about whether you are an alcoholic or not, whether you're a real alcoholic or a heavy drinker or whatever, you could have had your answer by now. And in We Agnostics in the first paragraph, it, it basically puts it down to two questions. When you want to quit, can you? Or do you still have to drink? You know, no matter how many days you go without drinking, but do you get to that point where you have to drink? And then the other question is, when you drink, can you control the amount that you drink? Can you have two beers and get up and go home? Can you have a cocktail or a glass of wine at dinner and stop right there? If not, you're probably an alcoholic. So... If when you really want to stop, you can't. And if you, when you drink, if you drink more than you can't control the amount you drink or the behavior while drinking, then you're probably an alcoholic. So we'll start off page 44, chapter four, we agnostics. In the preceding chapters, you have learned something of alcoholism. We hope we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. If, when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if, when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, you are probably alcoholic. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. What is a spiritual experience? If that's the only thing that can solve my alcoholism, I need to know what a spiritual experience is. 
Where can I find one? How can I make one happen? What do I do when something happens? We have to learn that. It's something when you come into AA, you don't usually have that grasp of what a spiritual experience is. And if you if you just re read, uh, if when you go to your first meeting and they read how it works and it says in step 12, having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps, we tried to carry the message of alcoholics and practices principles in all our affairs, you go, what? is that what do you mean if i do these steps i'm going to have a spiritual experience do i want a spiritual experience is it something i really want what do i have to do to get one you know how does it work so we have a lot of questions when we start looking into these chapters here i'm not a very religious person but i really didn't like religion much when I came into AA, I thought I really wanted to come into AA, and I came into AA, and I sat down, and first thing we did was pray. And then halfway through the meeting, they passed a basket around. And then at the end, we prayed again. We stood up and held hands and prayed. I'm going, oh, my God, did I get into a, some kind of weird church or something? What are these guys? I had no idea anything about what AA was, and it didn't look real friendly to me at that moment because those are things I hadn't done. I hadn't prayed in a group. I mean, I prayed when the cops pulled up behind me, but I never prayed in a group like that, holding hands and really praying. So I was very confused. And I wouldn't say I was at an atheist, and I wasn't really an agnostic, but I didn't really have any idea that God was anything that actually had anything to do directly with my life. So all these things that I was hearing about sounded very strange to me. So it goes on to say in paragraph two, to one who feels he is an atheist or agnostic, such an experience seems impossible, but to continue as he is means disaster especially if he is an alcoholic of the hopeless variety, to be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live by a spiritual basis was not always easy alternatives to face. So that was a hard choice. That was obviously going to be a big change in my life. It's going to be a big change in almost anybody's life when you come into AA and, you know, you're asked to start living on spiritual principles. I didn't even know what that meant. I didn't know anything about that. But this chapter helped me out. It goes on to say, but it isn't so difficult. About half our original fellowship were exactly that type. At first, some of us tried to avoid the issue, hoping against hope we were not true alcoholics. But after a while, we had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis of life or else. Perhaps it is going to be that way with you. But cheer up. Something like half of us thought we were atheists or agnostics. Our experience shows that you need not be disconcerted. So about half the people back then in Bill's age, about half the people claim to be agnostic or atheist. They didn't have God in their lives. They weren't people that used God or thought about God on their daily basis. They went about their lives and really didn't, they may have believed that a God existed, but it didn't affect their lives. So they didn't pay attention to them. They didn't think about them. They had to change. There was a change coming and many of them did change goes on to say, if a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. But we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us, no matter how much we tried. We could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, we could will these things with all our might but the needed power wasn't there. Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not sufficient. They failed utterly. 
And in our examples that we read and more about alcohols, we saw that happen to those guys. You know, they had a drink, they had been sober for a period of time, and they had their first drink. And then boom, they were off again. And when they got sober and Bill and Bob came to visit them, they said, I don't know what happened. I wasn't even aware. I didn't even think of it. I didn't even really try to not have a drink. I welcomed the drink and I drank it right down. And in all of our examples, they had two, three, four drinks, five drinks, six drinks to start off with just to get started and then continued to drink for days. And they knew they had a they had a little knowledge. Bill and Bob had talked to both of them, Jim and Fred. They'd already been talked to, but they each of those guys drank anyway. Jim had Jim had actually done the first three steps and still went out. And Fred had refused to believe in a power greater than himself and swear that self will and self-knowledge would fix him and he'd never drink again and then got drunk. So those things and our human resources failed us utterly. And the next paragraph is a big paragraph. This means a lot. This is important. Lack of power. That was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live. And it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. But where and how will we define this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. Okay, there you go. There's the meaning of the book. There's what the book is about. It's about helping you find a higher power that can solve your problem. And the rest of the book is about finding that higher power and how to use that higher power, incorporate higher power in our life to uh, let us depend and rely on this higher power that's more powerful than we will ever be. And that power can help lead our lives and guide us in a way that is much better than the life we were leaving, living before. So we need to find that power. And this book is going to do that for us. It says that means we have written a book which we believe to be spiritual as well as moral. And it means, of course, that we are going to talk about God. You can hear the scurrying of the feet in the back room and some live meetings of all the guys running out the back door going like, oh no, I ain't talking about God. Here, difficulty arises with agnostics. Many times we talk to a new man and watch his hope rise as we discuss his alcoholic problems and explain our fellowship. But his face falls when we speak of spiritual matter especially when we mention God. For we have reopened a subject which our man thought he had neatly evaded or entirely ignored. I'm going to read that sentence again. My throat is really bad tonight, folks, but we'll get through it. But his face falls when we speak of spiritual matters, especially when we mention God. For we have reopened a subject which our man thought he had neatly evaded or entirely ignored. So that puts a hurting on your thinking when this starts coming up because you've tried to avoid this subject. I've had, you know, some of my issues with God started when I was six years old. They'd been in my head, stuck in there because that's how I believed. And I wasn't real happy with those ideas. But they guided me through the rest of my life. And I got drunk, not because of that, but I got drunk in spite of that. And I got plenty drunk, plenty of times, and totally forgot about this idea that God existed or that God had anything to do with me. And I lived a life without ever referring to God. And I didn't know it, but I felt an emptiness 
there was an emptiness there that I couldn't fill and I didn't know what it was. I couldn't describe it. I couldn't find it. Nobody ever told me about it. I just felt empty. And it wasn't until after I came to AA that I found out what that emptiness was all about. And we'll find out more about it right here in this paragraph, in this chapter. We know how he feels. We have shared his honest doubt and prejudice. Some of us have been violently anti-religious. To others, the word God brought up a particular idea of him with which someone had tried to impress them during childhood. Perhaps we rejected this particular conception because it seemed inadequate. With that rejection, we imagined we had abandoned the God idea entirely. We were bothered with the thought that faith and dependence upon a power beyond ourselves was somewhat weak, even cowardly. We looked upon this world of warring individuals, warring theological systems, and inexplicable calamity with deep skepticism. We looked askance at many individuals who claimed to be godly. How, how could a supreme being have anything to do with it all? And who could comprehend a supreme being anyhow? Yet, in other moments, we found ourselves thinking, when enchanted by a starlit night, who then made all this? There was a feeling of awe and wonder but it was fleeting and soon lost. Many people had that issue. Having God, not paying attention, knowing God was there, but some feeling that they thought they had gotten rid of it. They thought they had gotten that idea. They slammed the door, but the door didn't latch. It opened up again. And that haunted them through their lives like it did me. That we had shut out God. And now, with our lives ruined by alcoholism, and we're seeking help, we have to take the help we can get. And the help we can get is an AA. And the help that we get is to guide us to a power greater than ourselves that can solve our drinking problem and any other problem. So it's a big turnabout. And that's why if we read in the back, and it refers to it again on the next page, the uh, appendix, spiritual experience in the back of the book, we learned about the white light experience or the either the white light experience or um, an educational variety experience. And so we had to figure out whether we, you know, what we were going to do and how that fit in and how that became a spiritual experience. And it was confusing to us. But they mentioned it again because it also says in that thing that we need open mindedness, willingness and honesty in order to be successful in quitting drinking, overcoming alcoholism. And so open-mindedness in this chapter is of primary importance. We really have to open our minds and let in some new ideas. Our old ideas have not worked. That's why we're here. And if we keep all those same old ideas and don't put any new ideas in there, we're going to remain an alcoholic. We're going to keep doing the same thing we've always done because they have all the same ideas. So when you come into AA and you feel like you've been beaten, then, you know, you got to get rid of the stuff that got you there. And that's those old threadbare ideas about God. You got to kick them out, get rid of them. Be honest. Look at those ideas and say, does this idea work? And if it doesn't work, then get rid of it. And be willing to do that. Be willing to actually let go of some of your old ideas. And so honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness play an incredible part in this chapter. They all wrap together and allow us, if we are 100% honest with ourselves, and if we're open-minded, and if we're willing to do whatever it takes, we can overcome alcoholism by accepting what it says in this chapter. So it's really, really important. It goes on to say, yes, we have agnostic temperament, 
have had these thoughts and experiences, let us make haste to reassure you. We found that as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commenced to get results, even though it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. And that's a big idea that you got to have is, you know, I came in and, and I couldn't even imagine what it was like to be in a relationship directly with a power greater than myself. I thought it was just too big for me to even think about. So how was I going to conform to this? How was I going to become part of this arrangement? And then I realized after listening to a million people in AA tell me, you only have to take a little tiny bite. You don't have to eat the whole elephant. One bite at a time. And that helped me move forward. That helped me not panic over where I was. That helped me just grow a little bit. My own conception of God on that day was a certain thing. It grows and it changes and it, it evolves into something beautiful. But you just got to give it some time. And you got to do a little work and you got to do a little spiritual thinking, a little spiritual living, you know, and try to make some changes and keep open minded, keep looking for the results. The results happen, but if we're not tuned in, we miss the results. We don't even see it happening. So we have to really pay attention. We have to do a lot of stuff to make sure that we don't miss the miracles. Stay until the miracle, we always say. Stay until the miracle happens. The miracle will happen one day. Not on your first day. Not on your 30th day. It doesn't happen then. It happens later. So you got to stick and stay. Got to really stay with the program. Much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and to affect a contact with Him. It doesn't matter what anybody else believes. It doesn't matter how they relate to God. It's how you relate to God. Your own conception of God, whatever you believe God is, is good enough. And it only has to be a little bit. And that little bit is enough to help you get that connection started. You know, and that's all we need. As soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took other simple steps. We found that God does not make too hard terms for those who seek him. To us, the realm of the spirit is broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to those who earnestly seek. It is open, we believe, to all men. So the key word in there is seek. You don't summons God, you seek God. You don't expect God to show up, you go looking. And that's what part of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is all about, is getting in that relationship with God and building that, that relationship with God and moving towards that relationship, seeking that relationship. Step 11 starts out. Sought through prayer and meditation. Sought is a, a form of seek. So we're seeking. And that's what we're doing. We're seeking. So uh, it's important. Seeking is fun. When therefore we speak to you of God, we mean your own conception of God. This applies too to other spiritual expressions which you find in this book. Do not let any prejudice you may have against spiritual terms deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. Spiritual terms, prayer, belief, worship, 
all those terms that they use in churches, spiritual terms, all those things. I used to have this barrier against those terms. Oh, I don't even want to talk to you about anything like that. You know, I would leave the room. I would walk away from the conversation. I didn't want to talk about it. And so it says here that we have to be open-mindedness, open-minded and honest enough to actually look at your ideas and see if they're any good for you. See if those ideas you've had all your life are helping you or hurting you, holding you back or moving you forward. If they're holding you back, if they're hurting you, get rid of them. Replace them with some new ideas. It sounds hard, but it's really not. You know, you're suffering from alcoholism. You're coming in here to get treatment of alcoholism. And the treatment requires some action on your part. And this action is easy. It's just thinking. You say, do I really feel that way about God? Do I still have that resentment against God because of something that happened when I was a kid? I think it's about time I let go of that. You let go of it. You stop having that resentment. Start Stop being afraid of God. You know, people are afraid. They think God is going to punish you. You think you're punishing God. You know, how many have been punished by God? Or we're all sitting here not punished by God. So when does he do all this punishing? God has never punished me. God has always been kind to me. God, God took care of me when I wasn't taking care of myself. God took care of me even when I was bashing him. You know, I didn't know it and I didn't accept it then, but I do know it now. So God is just loving and kind and patient and waiting for you. He's waiting for you to seek him. And that's what you do in AA. You come in here and you seek God. At the start, this is all we need to commence spiritual growth to affect our first conscious relationship with God as we understand him. Afterward, we found ourselves accepting many things then, which then seemed entirely out of reach. That was growth. But if we wish to grow, we had to begin somewhere. So we used our own conception however limited it was. So you don't have to understand very much. You just have to give it a shot. Be willing to believe. You don't have to believe. Nobody's telling you have to believe. But you have to be willing to believe if the proof comes. If the evidence comes, then believe. And the evidence will come. Just give it a chance. We needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? That's, that's a question and you answer that question. Okay. As soon as a man can say that he does believe or is even willing to believe, we emphatically assure him that he is on the way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. Asterix, appendix to spiritual experience. So go back and read that again. So the beginning of this relationship with a higher power is not a mountain. It's a leisurely walk. It's very simple. It's not going to wear you out. It's easy unless you block it. And if you build a wall between you and it, it will take you forever because you'll have to climb over your own wall. So don't put the wall there. That was great news to us, for we had assumed we could not make use of spiritual principles unless we accepted many things on faith which seemed difficult to believe. 
when people presented us with spiritual approaches, how frequently did we all say, I wish I had what that man has. I'm sure it would work if I could only believe as he believes, but I cannot accept as surely true the many articles of faith which are plain to him. So it was comforting to learn that we could commence at a simpler level. So you come into AA, you're brand new, you stick around for a few months, and you look at all the guys that have been here for 20, 30, 40 years, and they're laughing, and they're accepting God, and they're having their living spiritual principles, and they talk about it, and they're happy. You just wonder, how can, I wish I could be like that guy. You know, I want to be like that guy. Because he believes in this thing. Well, you're on your way. If you even want to be like someone who's spiritual, then you're on your way because you're looking for it. You're seeking it. You're recognizing it. You're seeing how it manifests itself in other people. And you like what you see. And you try to be like that. And you go do whatever you can. And you talk to that guy, and that guy tells you how he got there. And he helps you out. And we call that sponsoring. And that sponsor guides you through. It helps you have your own spiritual experience. And helps you build your relationship with a higher power. You don't have to do it alone. You're not by yourself. But you have to seek it. The time for a little bit more. Well, actually, let's stop there. Um, yeah, that's a perfect spot to stop, actually. And we'll continue next week learning how to build on this relationship with a power greater than ourselves, seeing what it looks like when it's fresh and brand new, and learn how to grow into it a little bit more. And learn a little more about honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness, which are essential in this. So thank you all for listening, and we shall see you next week.